so uh, can we just uh, start with uh, your interest in jazz? Like, what really got you turned on to jazz? Wow, um, that's a good one. For me, it was pirate radio actually, and uh, being a young boy in South London who was kind of tired of what I heard on the radio and just by chance falling across across, across a pirate station mm-hmm. called Radio Invicta on a Sunday. They used to broadcast for three hours on 92.4 and that's when I first heard people like Herbie Hancock and George Duke during their jazz funk disco periods and so I'd sort of hear this slightly more interesting music, a little bit less just standard on these stations. Uh, a lot of black funk music as well, like Cameo and Slave, Earth, Wind & Fire, groups like that. Earth, Wind & Fire was really important to me, that group, when I heard those records, because you'd, you'd, you'd hear the pop songs like September or Fantasy, you know, After the Love Has Gone or whatever, and then you'd sort of discover some early records by groups like Earth, Wind & Fire or Cameo, and you'd realise that they were so much more jazz-driven, because a lot of those groups were jazz bands initially. <laughs> And so through them, you then discover, you know, just follow the line. So before you know it, you're at Sun Ra. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, 15 years later, <laughs> you know, yeah. definitely not overnight. So for me, it was definitely the groove side of jazz that I kind of opened. I didn't sort of suddenly wake, wake up one morning and go, I really, I really like Eric Dolphy, uh-huh. you know, or Don Cherry's the man or whatever. <laughs> it wasn't like that for me. Yeah. But eventually you do kind of get there, right? Yeah. And now all I listen to is free jazz. <laughs> apart from apart from Robert. no, I, I listen to regular jazz. Well. <laughs> I don't know whether yeah. this would be serious or not. I'm looking at him. <laughs> He's not me yeah. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you are one of the main guys who made it cool to listen to jazz. So. Oh, okay, well, that's good. Well, I've tried, and I've always been quite aware of the. Uh, of the negative connotations that j- the word jazz brings to people, okay. and uh, and you know, I try not to talk about it too much. Just play it. That's my route, really. I mean, okay. I think the old thing to do is not to talk about it. Just play it. <laughs> Pretend it's not. You know. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> just, if, you, if you just play it, that's the, you know, it's the it's the great you know the great mystery. If people said to me, "You don't like," uh, you know, I don't know. People can if if you've made up it in your mind that you don't like something because you know you thought you weren't meant to like something, then, you know, you just don't want it. If, you t- if someone tells you what it is, then, I mean, if, it, if I play someone's space as a place, or, I don't know, all blues, or whatever, who doesn't know anything about jazz, there's a good chance they'll love it. Uh, yeah, that's true. Cool. So, uh, what, what brought you to Cuba, then? Cuba was um, a very wonderful opportunity that was presented to me a year and a half ago um, by a man called Francois Rini who works for Havana Cultura and he had enjoyed some albums that I released called um, In Africa and in Brazil that I did and he wanted more people to find out about the very excellent Havana Cultura website which celebrates new Cuban artists, musicians architects, photographers, and so he just said to me, do you want to go to Havana and check out the music scene there, and I'd never been to Cuba before, I was, you know, I was a fan of the Cuban sound, of course, and a lot of influence, going back to Chano Pozo and all those classic Cuban artists, and so for me it was like, great, trip to Cuba, paid for, I'm going to check it out, went over there, spent five days, and did a fast track kind of learning lesson about the new generation of musicians. A lot of jazz, a lot of hip hop. Well, some hip hop, quite a lot of reggae on. Mm. And so, in that time, I came back to the UK with maybe 60, 70 songs in my iTunes. And the idea was to do a compilation album of those songs, the new Cuban sound that I'd sort of discovered on my trip, and put together a nice playlist good compilation album and then Francois and Havana Couture said why don't you actually make an album as well as compile an album so I was like brilliant another trip to Cuba and so I went back a few months later and I teamed up with a guy called Vince Feller who I met in the UK um, and Roberto Fonseca who's the piano player 
and we worked out a way in which we could make an album in four days. We went to Egg Rem Studios, which is a wonderful, legendary studio where they recorded a lot of Buena Vista Social Club, and some, it's probably the sort of electric ladyland of Havana. And uh, booked that space, and four days of you know hard graft, hard work, discipline. With Roberto, we put together an album which came out as part of the double album, which is Havana Cultura. Okay. And uh, how do you go about finding the artist to collaborate with? On this album? This album and in general also. Like you, you're such so known, well known for discovering and exposing. Right. Well, I think one of the things for me is that I've always been on the radio and I've always made that quite an important part of my, you know, it's, even though I've had record labels and I've done all these other things, for me the kind of bread and butter that I do is I record a radio show every week. I yeah. broadcast a radio show every week. And I also am a club DJ. They're my two kind of fundamental bases of what I do. And by doing those roles, having those roles, I'm constantly hearing music and being given music. Um, so in a way, that's how I get to find out about stuff. You know, I get it early, and you know, I'm always traveling, and I'm always getting stuff given to me, and I'm always listening to it. And you know, that's how I kind of heard Go Town Project. You know, because I was in Paris, and Philip Cohen just said, "I really want you to release this on your label," even though I didn't release it on my label at the time, which I had done, but I couldn't. Or you know, Basement Jacks or Amy Winehouse or all those people. They were just people that. You know, they were because there wasn't anywhere else that was playing that kind of music. You know, you have to remember the, these artists at one stage were actually very unknown and very, and they couldn't find uh, a place to represent them, which is mad, isn't it, in a way? But you know, even Amy Winehouse, it took two albums before she became big. You know, so in a way, I find myself in a role that is actually quite unique. There's not many people who have that kind of musical definition that I have on my radio show always in my club sets um, which um, which means that a lot of these artists that come in from a slightly less obvious position they need someone like me to to sort of you know to to just I mean me and others like me to basically um, you know kick off their careers but uh, from your like a personal position what is it do you, do you look for a certain certain sound or is there something inside you that sort of has to like click inside of you or I just love it or I don't isn't it it's like that I mean the thing is and also you don't I, I, I also try not to completely smother myself with music all the time so okay. I just can listen to music in a way that I can enjoy music so that it doesn't feel like it's a job you know when you're doing this job as such there are responsibilities to keep turning out music but then if you overthink it then you're not going to enjoy music the way you should naturally enjoy it I don't know it's kind of a weird combination of different things so for me I just kind of go with the flow and I just like hopefully hear stuff and I'm not too elitist about it or exclusive about it for me it's like I'm always open to for me it's not just about getting it early or whatever you know what I mean it's like just it's just enjoying it when it comes and uh and, and sharing it with people. For me, it's just totally about how I'm feeling. You know, it's not about... Because you listen to a lot of radio shows and read a lot of people writing about music and it's all about kind of being first on something rather than actually their particular emotional response to the music. It's more about, you know, what it's meant to be like and how people are perceiving it. So it's like putting yourself outside of that position and more personal. And in a way, that's how I've always done what I do. Okay. Can we uh, bring that back to, uh, to Cuba, to Havana? Yeah. The series? How, uh, what was the, the selection process with uh, the artists that you collaborated with? With the artists, well, I was, again, the first trip I went over there, I basically got to meet a lot of people. As I said, Fast Tracked. Um, I got to meet Obsession, Doble Filo, Oguera, Roberto Fonseca. So I already got to know Aldeanos, all these great artists on my first trip over there and got okay. together a shortlist. And then basically, um, I just had to work out a way in which we could make this album work for the live recording. And Vince introduced me to the music of Mayra Valdez, who's the sister of Chucho Valdez of the group Irakira, who's got an incredible voice. So immediately I was like, this would be great to do a version of Rafa Rafa Fight and Checkeray Sun, because Checkeray Sun is a song that her brother recorded and wrote for Irakira, but with a male singer. So I thought it would be really good to get his sister to sing the first female version of that song, so that was really cool. And then another one who we invited on was a girl called Dana, 